Hey folks, it's Frithgar here, how you doing? Welcome back to Farming Simulator 22 with our Realistic series. There is a route to get into the field, it's not on this corner though, is it? We had to go further up. We can't get through there, unfortunately. There is a post there on the corner, but it's, it's a little bit inconvenient for us. It's a bit of a shame actually, it would have been better if we could go up there. Um, zebra crossing there, clearly um, we have right of way over a zebra crossing across the road. I don't know, if, if someone tells you different to that, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to pay any attention to it. No, I'm not paying any attention to that at all. Right, let's turn these off and then I want to do control X which should unfold everything. I can leave these swathed up but I mean... We can have them swathed or we can have them not swathed. But what I'm going to do in order to make this a little bit easier for us, because we don't want to just pick this stuff up. We need to turn it into hay first. Did I lease everything? I don't remember if I leased everything that I needed in order to do this job. Tedder, uh, mower. Uh, where's the baler? I got the tedder there. And I got the mowers. Did I buy the baler? Because I know I want that baler. Ah, right. Well, I didn't. What I'm going to do here is... I think it's control... Right, it's control Y to toggle the work mode. Uh, we've got... It's open at the moment, so it just spreads everything out on the ground. That closes both, and that leaves a single swath. That opens out one side, and you do it again, it opens out the other side. So what we'll have here is this. So I can... Control B to start it all up, and then Control Y, uh, Control V, and that will lower them down. So what we've got now is the front one doesn't change at all. That one just leaves the stuff as it is on the ground. The back two, I've got one is sweeping it in from the edge and putting it into a little bit of a swath. This is going to make it a lot easier for us when we're doing the rest of the field. So we're just pulling the grass away from the very outside edge. The rest of the grass will just be left out on the ground. But anything that was in close to the hedge is now being moved back a little bit. Um, I know quite a number of farmers who will go into a field that they want to make hay from. And they will cut the outside round of the field. And then they will go through and they will bale that up and turn that into silage. And then the rest of the field they will go through and turn it all into hay but the outside round because that outside round is usually the bit that's underneath the hedge um so it's very often it'll have a bit of shade over it from trees and stuff like that um it can make life a little bit more difficult to actually turn the outside round in hay and have it at the same rate as the rest of the field. Now, if you haven't got anything overhanging your field, if you've got no trees or anything like that, it's not going to make any difference. But if you have got a lot of trees in the hedges all the way around, bailing up just the outside round into silage and then doing the rest of the field as hay is something that's actually fairly common, I've been discovering. I've had a few people comment and say that they actually do the same thing on their farm. And some people only do just like a... Just, just one strip around the outside because they want to make as much hay as possible. Um, but it's still more convenient to do that than it is to actually make the entire field into hay anyway. Um, like if you have the entire field made into hay, it can be difficult getting the outside edges to be done at the same time as the rest of the field because the problem comes when the middle of the field, the bulk of the field, is ready to turn into hay, ready to bale up, but the outside round isn't. And if you go over and you turn it again, the stuff in the middle of the field, it can get too dry. And that is something that does actually happen. I, mean, I don't know about other countries, because I don't live in other countries, but here in the UK, um, it is actually a thing. It can be a bit of an issue in the grass gets too dry it gets brittle and starts to break up and it doesn't hold very well and it can become dustier so you don't want your hay your grass to dry out too much it becomes brittle it's dusty and it's not very good quality hay hay isn't grass that is completely dried out it's grass that's mostly dried out 
but it still has moisture in it and that, that moisture in it is part of what helps to actually turn it into hay. There is a process in the making of the hay. Once you've baled it up, you need to leave it for a while and then it goes from being dried grass that's been baled up and it actually turns into hay. So I, if, I don't think it's like um, you know, the fermentation that occurs when you're making silage because that's what happens with the silage um, is the grass is fermenting in the clamp. It's not quite like that. I think it is similar to that. But I do know, and I only found this out recently. I didn't actually know this before. Um, if you take hay that you have cut and baled, and you've only just baled it up, and so you, say you turned it into hay bales maybe um, a week beforehand, if you feed that to horses, it can make them really ill. You have to wait until it's finished making it into hay. And I'm, I'm not sure how long you're supposed to leave it for. But it can actually make horses ill if you give them hay that is not properly made. And I genuinely didn't know that. I really didn't. Um, I only found this out recently. Uh, well, I say recently. It was um, last summer I found this out. Um, but it still surprised me. I had absolutely no idea about that whatsoever. The fact that um, hay that has not actually formed yet in the bales... Um, can make animals sick. I, it, it genuinely surprised me. I was, I was really, really genuinely shocked at that. Um, right, what have we got? That is now completely done. So we've got a trailer over there that has got some... Well, we could go and put sugar beet in it. I'm not going to, though. What I'm going to do is I'm going to drive this one back up to the farm, and I'm just going to tip this straight out, so I don't need to use that trailer yet. We can pick the trailer up later, and we can take it up to the farm. That'll be absolutely fine. I need to go and check on the... Um, the weeder and that one's finished as well so we're going to want to move that one we've stopped the traffic on this road so that we can bring this one up the road here like this I'm hoping that I can squeeze in around here without any trouble whatsoever and then I can put that one out like that and it should tip everything in bring you over there like that and yes it does that's just going to dump all of the sugar beet in there and if we have a look in here that one's all now finished we are going to need to put another round of fertilizer on that field so we're going to do that today as well uh we'll probably end up having to do the same for 22 then aren't we uh let's have a look in here sugar beet we now have 230,000 liters of sugar beet that's pretty good. We've got another field to go and harvest yet, so we're going to have a nice lot of that. This one is still 15,000 in there, so that one's doing quite nicely, and we've got the cut sugar beet. We'll want to be moving that over and putting in the new one soon. Um, but that's not something that we need to do just yet. So I'm going to bring the harvester over this way. Reverse it up there. And we're going to stop right here. So let's turn off those beacons, lower down the header... And shut that one off. That one is now all finished. Next, I do need to start this one. So, as I said, what I'm going to try with this one is I'm going to just put it going in the corner of the field. I'm not going to drive around the edge of the field at all. I'm just going to let the tractor go and do it all on its lonesome. See if that actually works or not. I have no idea if it will. Um, usually it causes trouble with the fence lines so let's do that I'm not going to watch just going to leave it there let it carry on and we have got a bit more mowing to go and do so this tractor does slow down a little bit going up and down the hills well, well up the hills at least down the hills not quite so much um but he seems to be doing a pretty good job. We've got a nice wide cut here on the grass as well. I mean, maybe we'll get the wider cut later on with the really, really big mower. But the problem with the really, really big mower is that it, the tractors, the hired help, seem to have trouble with those ones. Actually getting around the corners, which I really didn't like. So I'm just going to bring you around there and then go into it in this direction. There, like that head up here so there's various different types of leaf cutter ants there's one type of leaf cutter ant that um, 
lives in Argentina on on the I think it's the the, the Pampas in Argentina, and they specialize in just grass. It's vast grasslands there, and the ants. Like most other grasslands in the world, are maintained by large herbivores, and it's large herbivores that keep them as you know large areas of grassland. In Argentina, the pampas, the, it's pretty much completely shaped by leafcutter ants, which is absolutely amazing to me. It, it really is. There's millions and millions and millions of individual ants. And they're the ones that keep the grassland looking the way the grassland does, which is incredible to me. Um, and the other good, you know, amazing thing about it is they take all this material in, and then they have um, waste from the colony. That all gets buried into the ground. They put that underneath their colonies, so it stays buried in the ground, which I think is even more amazing. So basically, they're just going along and quietly fertilizing the vast pampas and uh, the grasslands um, keeping it all harvested and then fertilizing it and keeping the grass growing and it's it's absolutely incredible those are specialized grass collectors um, most other ones they go for broadleaf plants rather than grass and there's I think it's, they have slightly different uh, fungus that they grow there's various different types of fungus that the leafcutter ants grow. Um, I think, like some species do, share um, uh, fungus species as well. But generally, I believe that each ant colony, it, it, each type of ant, has their own particular brand of fungus that they use at the same time. And this fungus it, is everything is focused around this fungus Every, everything um, some types of ants they actually have another type of fungus that grows on them it grows on their backs and it's a type of it's almost like a penicillin and it keeps their fungus healthy it, it helps to stop diseases coming in and affecting their fungus now it's not all types of ants that have this um, but it is some and I think it's absolutely incredible that you've basically got these ants are farmers they are growing crops and they're actually using pesticides to keep away other diseases and other competitive funguses that might turn up in their nests they're actually using pesticides to keep it all under control um, naturally occurring pesticides rather than you know manufactured chemical ones that just indiscriminately kill everything like we have but you get the idea and that's absolutely incredible to me I, I I never cease to be amazed by ants I think they are utterly incredible and even those of us here in the UK or in the rest of Northern Europe I don't know if you have them in the US um, the the black garden ant um, It'd be in the more northern parts of um, the US if you do have them because they don't do well in a tropical climate. Um, one of the biggest issues that people have who keep them as uh, pets is if you've got them in a central heated house, you do actually have to hibernate them. Because if you keep them in a centrally heated house and you don't artificially hibernate them, as in make it go cut why have you stopped if you don't artificially hibernate them um what you end up with is the queen ends up she sort of gets really really sluggish and her laying slows right down and it's actually really bad for the colony so you do need to make sure they experience cold temperatures so that they hibernate and sleep for the winter and if they don't do that ultimately those ants can die and it will kill off the colony because they're just they're evolved to a temperate climate and not a warm tropical one so that's one of the big issues that people do face with um, an ant colony that is for a temperate climate in a centrally heated house the ants don't hibernate because the temperature doesn't get low enough and then you're left with ants that need to hibernate but haven't because the natural triggers that they would get from lowering temperatures haven't happened and it essentially they just get worn out um, so you do have to pay a little bit of attention to them but those ants they're also farmers 
they go out and they um, if you've got a lot of aphids on plants nearby, near their nests, they will carefully look after, clean and groom all of those aphids. They, they really do care for them a lot. Aphids feast on the sap of plants. That is what they do. They, they consume vast quantities of sap out of plants. Anybody who does a lot of gardening will know that aphids are not necessarily very good for the plants because they drink all the sap. And if you've got a heavier aphid infestation, it can be a bit of a problem. The ants, they like the aphids because the aphids, they drink the sap in order to get the sugar from it, but they cannot convert all of the sugar. They can't use it all. So they excrete the um, or any of the liquid and the excess sugar in a form that the ants can actually eat. So the ants will look after and guard the aphids and carefully gather up all of the aphid excrement, which is just basically liquid sugar. Um, and they carry that back to the nest and they use that as a food source. So you've got little tiny, tiny creatures who are doing livestock farming. You've got the, um, the leafcutter ants who, do, uh, who grow their own crops. And you've got quite a few other types of ants who do livestock farming. They will defend their aphids to the death. They are very protective of their aphids and they will defend them to the death. The aphids... They do quite well out of this whole thing, um, because the ants are not going to eat them. Um, let's just go and check on our others here a minute. We'll have a little bit of a break from the mowing just for a second. Um, the aphids are not going to go and eat the little bit there that needs to be turned. Um, the, aphid, the, the ants are not going to go and eat the aphids. They look after the aphids. The aphids provide them with food. So they will look after. The aphids do really, really well out of this arrangement. They get a nice source of food, and the ants will fight off any predators that they might have. Um, I haven't really looked into what the ants do with looking after the aphids, whether or not they do um, cull some of them occasionally or anything like that. Um, I did remember I, I do remember reading somewhere quite some time ago that ants will move aphids around i don't know if that was accurate information or not because i haven't seen it anywhere else since so i don't know about that but i do know that you've essentially got ants as livestock farmers um they look after those aphids they guard them against predators if anything's coming along to harm the aphids but will ignore the ants like a uh, ladybird for example um because ladybirds they love aphids that's what they munch on the ants will try to defend their aphids as much as they possibly can right they, they are quite attached to these little sugar producers um so you you can actually have that reproduced in captivity it is possible to get them to do have the same kind of behaviors going on in captivity if you want um all you've got to do is just basically have uh, some plants near your ant nest that have aphids on them. Like you, you can just have a feeding area for the ants. Quite a common idea for a feeding area for ants is to have a um, op an open air piece for the ants to, to well, basically just like a little table or something like that but it's got a moat of water around it and then they access it via a tube. So they get into this area through a tube and once they get to that area then they can roam around on the table without any issues whatsoever and the um they can't escape from that bit because you've got a moat of water around the outside edge and it makes it very very easy to feed them and things like that because you don't have to be taking a lid off of their tank or anything um you can just put it down in this open area and they'll very often use the open area as a rubbish dump from their home as well to start with, the rubbish dump will be back in their main area. They'll just sort of put it into the corner. But if they expand enough, they will generally start to move the rubbish away from the nest completely. And the food, the feeding platform is quite common. It's quite a common thing to actually see them not just tipping the... Um, folding is not allowed. It's quite a common thing to see them... Uh, chucking the food, the, the, the waste into the moat. 
the moat that goes around the outside edge of their feeding platform that you've got. Uh, it's quite common to see the ants dumping the waste into there. And you do have to be a little bit careful and keep an eye on them with that because they can, and I've heard plenty of stories of it happening, they chuck so much rubbish into the moat that they basically form themselves a bridge and then they're off and they can go exploring anywhere they want to after that. So you do have to be careful and you do have to keep an eye on them. But that's the same with any pet. If you keep a pet, you do have to look after it and ants are no different. Right, I'm going to just leave that one there. I'll go back and get that one in a little while. Uh, this one is actually doing a pretty good job so far. So I'll leave that one and there and uh, we're going to go back up to the mowing now and we're going to go and do a little bit more of this it's not going to take very long before we've done the mowing and then we can go and get the hay turner and bring that one up so the mowers we will return we're not going to keep those they're just on lease anyway we'll send those back ideally i'd like to buy a baler but we're not going to be able to afford that yet so i'm going to have to just lease that one as well um a little bit of a shame nice if we can afford to actually buy the baler. So that's a baler that I would like to use quite frequently. And with the straw, we do get quite a bit of straw. It would be quite handy to be able to use on that as well. And the great thing about the baler is that when we're doing hay, we're not going to have to go over the field first with a rake because obviously the rake is built into the baler. That's the one that we're going for. Um, Let's bring you around here. Right, we're very, very nearly almost done on it. I'm just going to finish up this little bit of grass a minute, and then we can see about getting our hay turner up here. You know, it just occurred to me that we could actually just have the hired help doing this job. Let's try the hired help on this job a minute and see how they get on with it. So he's going to go in a straight line down there. And just finish this up reason that we want the hired help doing some of this is because then we're free to go and do some other work. We'll probably have to just tidy a few bits up afterwards. I completely forgot that we can actually use hired help to do mowing. Done it enough times. I don't know why I forgot. Right. Well, I'll let that one carry on there and I can have this one then and drive this one back home. So I'm done with this. The sugar beet field that we went and did that one's going to need to be plowed now so i've got to plow that one up and i will ultimately have to plow field 35 uh field 36 is currently needing a layer of lime across it now the needs rolling found out why none of the fields seem to need rolling i was confused as to why they didn't need rolling and maybe it's just something that we don't have on this map it turns out uh thank you very much to uh Wait a minute. Lucas Fent Farah Army. Um, thank you very much to Lucas Fent. Um, he let me know after watching one of the videos where I was saying about the, the rolling. He said, yeah, that's because you've got a mod installed that actually stops that. It's called the Seedbed uh, Reconsolidation mod. And it basically adds a roller function to most of the seed drills. I completely forgot that I had that one. I do remember seeing it when I first installed it and thought, actually, that's really, really good because rolling is, like, such a tedious affair and uh, generally it doesn't really add much to the videos that I do. I mean, yeah, it, it does add a, a level of realism to it, but it doesn't add a lot to the videos. It'd be nice if we could just skip that stage and have the fields rolled. And it turns out that we can. So thank you very much to Lucas to pointing that out to me. That is absolutely fantastic. Um, I'll wash the rest of the tractor in a minute. We're going to go... You know what? This one can just stay with the plow hooked on. I don't actually need to take the plow off because I don't think I'm going to want to do anything else with this tractor for at least a little while. So I'm just going to tuck that one in there. I will actually unhitch that one a second just so that I can wash the tractor itself because um, I, I don't want to leave the tractor really filthy. There. That's, that's looking good, that is. There. Look at that. Shiny Gold McCormick. That one is going to plow up this field down here as soon as we've done this. I did say before that, you know, I was toying with the idea of removing the collision on this one and that one down there. Just to make it easier for us to do the farming around here. Um, and I did have a response or two with that. And you're generally accepting of the idea of that. Uh, remove the collision on these. It just make it a little bit easier for doing our work around here. 
Um, so I will probably end up doing that. Not yet, but I will probably end up doing it at some point. Right, you're doing just fine. Let's go and check on our hired help now and see how he's getting on. He's done quite a bit here. He's backing down. He's only got a little tiny bit of the field left. So I'm going to take over from him. Just start these mowers up. And doing a triangle, generally, it's a bit of an awkward thing. Because it doesn't seem to matter which way you do things. It always takes time. It always takes a while to get the triangle done correctly. Generally, what I will try and do if I'm working a triangle is cut, tip off the triangle and, and, and work it like this. So I'll bring that one down there like that. And then cut this side off. Basically, just work up and down on each side of it. So that's not much of a run on that bit there, but I can then come on up and spin round and we'll go down this long run here. And I'll just kind of keep doing that and work it in this kind of shape. So it, it may not be ideal, and I thought I was going to miss that bit there, but no, we didn't. Bring you down this way. It's also quicker than stopping and shunting backwards and forwards, turning round to completely go back on the run that I've just done. I can go up there. And two more passes and we're done. And then we can fold this one up. We'll take the mowers back. They need to be returned and we will get the great big hay turner that we've leased. Put that one onto the tractor and then that's it. We bring that one up here. That's going to be very, very quick to do. I don't actually need the back mowers down at all. I can lift those up, even turn them off. Do that bit there. Right. Now, if I do Control V, and I lift them both up, Control B to turn them off, Control X will fold both of them up at the same time. I really like that option, being able to just do everything all at once. It does make life a little bit easier, doesn't it? Uh,. Is there a better way? I don't think there is. I think we do need to go out this top end of the field every time. I don't think there is any easier way to get to the sheep. I mean, we could go out up there, and then you've got to go down that road and all the way there. So this is definitely the easiest way. The easiest way would be out that corner there, but that one's not an option, unfortunately. So we have to go out here. Now that we own this field, I feel like we should do something out here. Just, just put a little track in across that bit of scrub there. I mean, I'll be honest, I, maybe we don't need to put a track across that bit of scrub because I've used entrances like that in the field plenty of times. Unfortunately, folks, that is all we have got time for today. A massive thank you to everybody who has earned their way into the Great Book of Names. To find out some more details about all the names coming past, please head into the description and click on the link to the Discord. It's a link to another video. The link is on the other video. Uh, please also consider checking out the links there for Nitrado, who provide gaming servers for games like Farming Simulator, Minecraft, Ark, and several others. And there's also Fanatical, who will help support your gaming habit by providing you with cheap games and also giving me a small commission on anything that you buy using my link. Uh, if you've enjoyed this particular video, then please head down below and give us a like. And if you really enjoyed it, then please tell your friends all about me. Get them to come and watch as well. That would be awesome. And until next time, thank you very much for watching. This is Frithgar. Goodbye, and see you later.